Welcome once again to our study of Exodus here at GBC. If you're joining us for the first time, we have been going through uh, the book of Exodus uh, chapter by chapter, not verse by verse, but chapter by chapter. Uh, if you miss any of these sermons or any of these messages, they're all on YouTube and on our podcast and on our website. So uh, please take the time to listen to any of the messages that you've missed. Uh, if you were here last week, uh, we spoke about the topic of uh, expectations and disappointments. Uh, we talked about how high hopes and expectations that are not met uh, almost always lead to bitter disappointment. Uh, this is what uh, happened to our story last week. Right, if you remember where the story is in Exodus, where we're at, after seeing and hearing from Aaron and Moses, the, the Israelites had uh, high hopes and expectations for freedom from slavery to the Egyptians, right? Aaron and Moses went back to Egypt, uh, or Moses went back to Egypt, met with Aaron, spoke with the elders and the people of Israel, did some signs, right, that God told him to do. Aaron spoke the word of God, and they were all... Just like, let's go, let's get out of here, right? God is finally going to, to save us. Uh, but after approaching Pharaoh, uh, after Moses and Aaron approached Pharaoh, and Pharaoh rejected their proposal for a three-day sabbatical, so to speak, for the people of Israel, um, disappointments start to take place. Um, so much so that the next part of the story uh, sees that disappointment become doubt. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, experienced that. The more you get disappointed, the next time that person who disappoint you or whatever that thing is that disappointed you, the next time they promise something to you, you just say, no, yeah, yeah, no. You let me down too many times. No, I'm not going to believe this next one. That's what's happening to the people of Israel, right? They were brought up so high to be brought down so low led to doubt, right? We heard it from Moses himself, right? Moses, after this one uh, rejection from Pharaoh, started to doubt God. Uh, verse 22, chapter 5. Moses turned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to these people? See how much doubt? There? He's even doubting the goodness of God by saying it was God that did evil to uh, these people by allowing Pharaoh to do evil to them. Right? Why did you ever send me, says Moses? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to these people. And you, talking to God, have not delivered your people at all. Right? Moses had some guts, right? To call God, to call out God like that? Right? After one rejection, after one disappointment, Moses started to doubt. What about the people of Israel? How did they respond? Chapter 6, verse 9. After God told Moses what to say to these people, he went to the people of Israel and told them. But what happened? They did not listen. Why? Because of their broken spirit and... Our slavery. That's what we said last week, right? The process of disappoint the, the process of disappointment, what happens? You get brought up so high, you get rejected, and then work gets added. All of a sudden, that disappointment becomes doubt. Right? Once again, if you read that and if you uh, think about your own situation, um, we can see ourselves in the narrative of the Israelites and even Moses here, right? The more we get disappointed, the more we start to doubt, right? After being disappointed that the freedom that they have been waiting for got delayed, the Israelites and even Moses started to doubt. Doubt started to creep in their hearts and their minds. Now, ultimately, our enemy's goal is this, is to get us to doubt God's goodness and his word. That's the goal of Satan. That's the goal of this whole world, is to get us to doubt God. 
This is the strategy from the beginning of the enemy, right? Think about it, if you go back to Genesis, how did Satan tempt Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit? Well, what's the question that Satan posed to Eve so that Eve would start thinking and doubting God? Satan said to Eve, did God really say so and so? Did God really tell you that you're not supposed to eat of the fruit? That made Eve think. Did, did God really say that? Eve started to doubt. Uh, in our story here in Exodus, the enemy is using disappointment to make the Israelites and even Moses doubt. Doubt if God will or can really save them. Right? Say that speaks through the disappointment saying, will God really save? Can God really save? If Pharaoh keeps on refusing. And that's what's going to happen, right? Pharaoh will keep on refusing. And so it's, uh, it's, it's one thing for us to feel sadness or to feel upset because of disappointment. But it's another thing for us to say to God, Hey God, you've sinned against me. Right? Because you didn't do what you said you would do. And if you think about it, that's what it means to doubt God. God, you didn't do what you said you would do. You said you would protect me. You said you would do this. You said you would... You sinned against me, God. Right? That's what it means to doubt God. Now, in between those two verses, from the end of chapter 5 to... Uh, chapter 6, verse 9, there's a whole chunk of verses in between, right? We can think about that verses, those verses as the meat of this whole lesson when it comes to doubting God, right? Now, in, the, in, in between the two doubts, Moses' doubt in chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, and then uh, the Israelites' doubt in 6, 9, there is this chunk of verses where God explains himself, where God um, shows us how to overcome doubt, how does God respond to Moses' statement at, this, at the end of chapter 5? And also, how does God respond to the Israelites doubting at the uh, chapter 6, verse 9? We can find it uh, in the verses in between. So verses uh, 1 to 8 of chapter 6. That's what we're going to be taking up this morning. I think we're going to take a look at how God responds when doubted, and at the same time, uh, see how God helps us overcome our doubts. So are you guys ready? Awake? Let's go. 6, 2, and 3. Let's read it again. God spoke to Moses and said to him, what? I am the Lord. 3. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord... I did not make myself known to them. But by, by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So the first response that God gave Moses after being doubted by him and the Israelites is to remind them of who he is. Right? Remind them of who he is. I don't know if you guys like boxing. I like boxing. Uh, I've been watching boxing since I was a kid. My, my dad introduced me to it. Um, there's this boxer by the name of Roy Jones Jr. You guys remember Roy Jones Jr.? When Roy Jones Jr. was at the top of his game, he was pound for pound the best boxer in the world. That means he could have beaten anybody. It doesn't matter what weight class. And in fact, he won middleweight, super middleweight, light heavyweight, and even the heavyweight championship of the world. At his height, he won all of those weight classes. He started off at middleweight. Right? When he got to heavyweight, they were doubting him. They said, how can a middleweight win the heavyweight championship of the world? It's impossible. No one has done it. Well, Roy Jones did it. <laughs> right? But when people started doubting him before the fight, Roy Jones said, you must have forgot. You all must have forgot who I am. I won 
this, this, this. I'm undefeated. You all must have forgot. <laughs> Why are you doubting me? That's what God is doing here in, in uh, our story in Exodus, right? What did you say, Moses? I, I'm evil. <laughs> I caused evil to the Israelites. I'm not delivering them. Do you remember who I am? Right. God's first response to Moses is to remind him who he is. And if you think about doubts, especially doubting God, that's at, usually at the root of our doubts. We forget who God is. We forget all the goodness that he has shown us throughout the years. We forget how many times he's pulled us out of trouble. We forget how many times he's been our fortress. Right? So God's response to that is, you all must have forgot. So what does God do? He gently reminds Moses, reminds the Israelites, reminds us of his character in order to help us overcome our doubts. What does God say? Verse 2, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. That's interesting, right? Why would he say that? Why would God say, yeah, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I didn't really appear to them. I didn't really show myself to your forefathers. What does God mean by that? Uh, to paraphrase that statement, uh, it means that even though I revealed myself to your forefathers, they did not know me as you will know me after all of this is said and done. That's what God is saying. They, they didn't, they haven't seen me the way you're going to see me. Right? These forefathers are yours. Or you can also read it as, I did not reveal myself to them as I will you. After all of this is said and done. This means that what God is about to do to Pharaoh in order to free the Israelites from slavery will show just how or just who God really is. It's God's prequel to the plagues. God's prequel to the plagues that he's about to unleash because of Pharaoh's hard heart and in order to show the Israelites who Yahweh, God, really is. So when doubt starts to creep in, when Moses voiced it out, the Israelites voiced it out, God said, you all must have forgot. Remember who you're talking to. Remember who I am. That's the first thing that God said. Second thing that God does in this text, is not only to remind Moses and the Israelites of his character, but also to remind them of his promises. That's the second thing that God does. Okay? When you start doubting God, remember who God is. And remember, if that's who God is, remember his promises. Verses 4 and 5, he says what? Can you guys read that? Okay. He reminded them of his covenant, of his promises. Now what's interesting here is that God reminds Moses that his covenant with their forefathers and his covenant or promise to them to free the Israelites from slavery is one and the same. Right? It's the same covenant. What does that mean? Why is that so significant? Why? Because it shows us that God's faithfulness to fulfill His promise there's, does not expire. There's no expiry date until it's done. Right? It doesn't expire. God will be faithful to see that all of His promises will be fulfilled even if it takes generations in order to fulfill them. And God guarantees us that no matter what happens, this is from Romans 8, no matter what happens, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, death, nor life, angels, nor rulers, things present, nor things to come, 
no height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be what? Will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. None of these things, it doesn't matter what happens. God will fulfill His promise. It doesn't matter how long it takes. God will fulfill His covenants. It doesn't expire. Amen? Why do we all look so worried? Come on. It doesn't expire. His promise to the forefathers is still true for us today. Not all the promises, okay? But there are promises that was true for them and it's true for us still today. Now, will, they, will there be delays? Yes. Right? But like I said last week, if your hope is in God and not the hope that this world has, you take these delays as, oh, it's just God revving me up again to get to the next peak. Right? There will be delays, but it doesn't matter what may cause the delay. It doesn't matter how long or how many times we get delayed. We can rest assured that God will be faithful to fulfill all of his promises. Amen? Amen? So if there's anything that you've been praying for for years and years and years, guys, God listening? Yeah. It's just not the right time yet. Same thing here. How long has the Israelites been waiting here to be redeemed, to be freed? Years. 400 plus years. Is God not doing anything? Is he just waiting? Is he just watching us suffer? During this time? No. He's working on us so that when the time comes, we'll be ready. That's what happened to the Israelites. That's what happened to Moses. But he will fulfill his promises, no matter what happens. So first two things that God re replied, when doubt comes to Moses, when doubt invades the Israelites' mind, Remember who I am. Second, remember my promises. Right? Third. Third thing that God does here in our text to remind us of what he will do in order to fulfill his promises. God reminds us, and the Israelites and Moses, of what he will do in order to fulfill his promises. Check out uh, verses 6 to 8. Again, read it please. These are, uh, if, you, if you were paying attention, if you are observing the text, you can see that there are seven statements there that contain the, the, the words, I will. Okay. The I will statements of God okay, to the Israelites. That's where it's found. I will do this. I will do that. I will, I will, I will. Seven I will statements. This is God's promised salvation in seven statements of guaranteed action on, God, on God's part. Guaranteed. It's not I might. Right? It's I will. Guaranteed action on God's part. Seven statements of it. To help overcome the doubt of Moses. To help overcome the doubt of the Israelites. And, and notice how God starts it off. He starts it off with, by saying, I am the Lord. 
And again, this is the guarantee that these uh, unshakable foundation of these statements, of these I will statements, it's God himself. God's character. Right? Now, I know a lot of us, especially those of you who have kids, uh, this is totally different. When you hear God say, I will, he actually does it. Uh, I know uh, in my household anyway, uh, my wife will attest to this, um, that the I will statements at home usually doesn't get done. <laughs> usually. Right? My, my wife would tell us, uh, can you do this? And I would say, yeah, 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 I will. <laughs> Guess what? Still not, <laughs> still not done. <laughs> but we always say that, right? We always say, I will. Somebody asks us to do something, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Or let me, let me put it to, you, to, you, to your context. When somebody says, can you pray for me? What do you say? I will. Who here actually prays for these people? Some of us do, but some of us will just say, yeah, I will. But don't do it. <laughs> right? That's, that's the human I will. So let's, let's, get that, let's get that out of our, our minds as we look at God's I wills. Because God's I wills will get done. Right? I know some of you have been uh, hurt by some friends. You know, uh, Let's meet up at this station. Uh, let's meet up at this time. Your friend will say, I will be there. <laughs> and come like five hours late, six hours late. That's not God. God will not only do thy wills, he will do it. At the right, perfect time. Right? So let's, let's look at it. When, when you look at the I wills of God, let's just take away the human I wills. Okay, I know some of us are saying, uh, well, my dad told me this. My, no, 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 no. This is God. This is not your dad. This is not your husband. This is not, these are not your kids. All right? God will actually do his I wills. Right? These I will statements are the very solid foundation and therefore the very assurance of God's salvation. These I will statements do not just apply to the salvation of the Israelites from slavery to Egypt, but more importantly, to the salvation of sinners from slavery to sin. So let's take a look at these I will statements. And hopefully I can get through this in the time that I have left. Check out the first two I will statements found in verse 6. What are the I will statements found in verse 6? If you don't have your Bibles, I don't know if they're going to flash it over there. What are the two I will statements found in verse 6? The first two. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. Those are the first two I wills, right? Found in verse 6. Bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Deliver you from slavery to the Egyptians. We can put these two statements in a group as both of these statements talk about the liberation or the freedom of the Israelites. Right? I will deliver you. I will free you from slavery. Uh, and that's what it means. When, when, when God says, I will free you, being saved by God means that you're going to be free. Right? He will free you from slavery, free you from captivity or Bondage, And this is what the Israelites have been waiting for all these years. But let's not get this twisted to mean that this freedom is ultimately being able to do the things that the Israelites wanted to do. He didn't free them so that they could do whatever they want. Okay? Let's not get that twisted. God's freeing from slavery is for the purpose of being able to do the things that God wants them to do. Not just to be free to do whatever they want. It's for what God wants them to do. Paul states it as being free from slavery to sin, to become a slave of righteousness. Check out Romans 6, 15 to 23. It says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Uh, do you not know that if you present yourselves as anyone, as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, 
or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, what happened? Have become what? Slaves of righteousness. 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to purity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And its end, eternal life. Last verse. Can you guys read this? Amen. Right. What is Paul trying to say? Paul's trying to say that whether you are a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness, you are a slave. Because wherever you offer your members to, members meaning your body, your self, your mind, your heart, that's your master. And will always have one. If God is not your master, guess what? You're still not the master. <laughs> Somebody else is still the master. But when your master is sin, it feels like you're free to do whatever you want. Right? Why? Because you're a what, sinner. We were all born sinners. That's why when the master is sin, oh, I, I want to smoke, I smoke. Yes, I can do this. I want to drink, I drink. I want to have sex, I'll do it. I want to kill, murder, whatever, lie, do whatever you want. It's okay. Because why? You're a slave to that. You're free in that regards to do or to act upon your nature. But where does that lead? <laughs> That's what Paul's saying, right? What is the fruit of all that? Sin leads to death. Anybody here wants to keep living that way? Yeah, here, you can YOLO all you want here. You know what YOLO means? I know some, some older people don't know what YOLO means. YOLO, you know what YOLO means? You only live once, you might as well try everything. <laughs> if you're a slave to sin, you're free to do all that. Right? Nothing is pulling you, you know, nothing is making you feel guilty. You're free to do all of those things. But where does it lead? So God, in His grace, sees that if this person keeps going this way, they're going to end up in hell. And because he's a God of love, God of grace, God of mercy, he frees us from that. Well, he doesn't free us so that we can keep continuing to do whatever we want. He frees us from that in order to, it says in Romans 6, sanctify us. So that the things that we want to do when we were sinners, we don't want to do anymore. It changes. That's what changes in a Christian. You can't call yourself a Christian if the things you were doing as a sinner, you're still doing as a Christian. You're not a Christian. Right? Now again, Will we become perfect after being freed by God? Will we stop sinning? No. But you'll start growing in sanctification. But you'll start growing towards the likeness, more and more towards the likeness of Christ. Things that you once did before, you can't, you can't do anymore. Or if you do do it, it doesn't feel right. Why? Because you have been freed from that. At the same time, you've been free to say no every time somebody or something tempts you to sin. You're not under the spell anymore. You're not 
You're not under that master anymore. So now you have the power to say, no, I'm not going to do it. You don't own me anymore, sin. I'm not going to do it. You say no to it. That's the power of God in sanctification to help us overcome temptation. But again, freedom from God doesn't mean freedom to do whatever it is that you want to do. And this is the freedom that God will accomplish for us, ultimately. Okay. This, this whole thing will, will end when we die. I don't believe we're ever going to be perfect while we're still here in this world. Um, when we die, that, that's the end of our sanctification. That's when we gain perfection when we die. Or until He returns. Um, a freedom to do uh, what He created us for, that's the freedom that God gives to people. Freedom to bear fruit. To be people who are being transformed from one degree, degree of glory to another. And in the end, to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we make that journey of sanctification, we must first be set free from our current master, and that is sin and Satan. There is no journey to make if we are still slaves to sin. And don't get it twisted, okay? If you start doing things that you think will free you from slavery to sin, then you you got it backwards. You got to be free from slavery to sin first, then free to do what God wants you to do. What do I mean by that? Don't come to church thinking coming to church will free you from slavery to sin. That is not what frees you from slavery to sin. Singing hymns doesn't free you from slavery to sin. Reading the Bible doesn't free you from slavery to sin. What frees you? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what frees you to do what God wants you to do. Right? Before that, you're a slave to sin. Okay? And you need to be freed from that slavery first to make that journey of sanctification. If you were to apply that to the Israelite story, the journey to the promised land cannot happen as long as they are slaves to Egypt. They have to be freed from that first. And then they can go make their journey of sanctification to the promised land. But God must free them first. That's the first thing that God reminds Moses that he will do. Okay? To overcome guilt, God reminds Moses of who he is, his promises, and what he's going to do. The first I will statements that God says to Moses is that I will free you. I will give you freedom, but not to do whatever you want. <laughs> I will give you freedom to be my people. Amen? Frees them as slaves to be his people. And I'm going to go back to that, uh, to back to, back to that analogy later on. Um, what is the second thing that God will do? Or the third I will statement found in the last part of chapter 6. Check it out. Can you flash chapter 6 again? First two I will statements is about freedom. What's the third I will statement? I will what? I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Uh, one commentary uh, says this about the topic of redemption. Okay? I will redeem you, God says. This is a topic of redemption. One commentary says this. Redemption is a financial term. In the ancient marketplace, it was used to describe the release of a slave by the payment of a ransom. 
Later, this became part of the biblical law. If an Israelite had to sell himself into slavery in order to pay a debt, his own family members would redeem him by paying the price for his freedom. Okay. That's what redemption, that idea of redemption is in the Bible. Okay? It's the payment paid to free, buy, redeem, ransom a slave to become yours. Okay? Clear so far? Now, this topic of redemption is rarely discussed on the pulpit. Okay? Uh, I rarely heard, you know, sermons on redemption. Um, because it's, it's really complicated. <laughs> okay. I think that's one. But we're going to try to simplify it. Uh, hopefully, try to simplify it for you guys the rest of the time that I have. So now, if redemption has something to do with payment... Or a ransom, some, some we call it. Then we can also say that the financial aspect of redemption is like a transaction. Redemption, there's a transaction happening. Something being exchanged for another. Right? That's what redemption is. Um, there's some transaction happening. Now in a transaction, there's four key players, four key parts. Okay, what are the parts of a transaction? The one who receives the payment... The one who pays, the one who is paid for, and the amount or the cost. So, you guys following so far? If redemption is a financial term, it's like a transaction, then the transaction has four players. The one who's paying, the one who's receiving the pay, the one that's being bought, and the cost. Okay? Now, in the case of the Exodus, in the case of what's happening to the Israelites in Egypt, okay, if God says, I will redeem you, there's got to be a transaction made. Who are the players or who are the key parts of the transaction we can see in the story of the Exodus? Okay? You guys following so far? I know this became a math class all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> who are the key players in the transaction? Let me ask you the question and then you answer it, okay? Based on the story of the Exodus, okay, and based on our text, okay? So who pays? Huh? Really, sir? <laughs> God. God is the one who pays for the. The ransom, who pays the ransom, who pays the cost. Who is being paid for? At the story of the Exodus is the Israelites. They're the ones that God is trying to redeem. What did God use to pay for them? What's the cost? As far as the story goes of Exodus... It's these mighty acts of judgment. That's what God did in order to free the Israelites. Right? Okay? Now, last one. Who received the cost? Pharaoh. Right? God, because of his grace and goodness, paid cost, mighty acts of judgment, to the Egyptians, so that he could redeem his people. Straightforward, right? Now what about if we take that, okay, and transfer it to the exodus of sinners, as far as salvation is concerned, okay? Same questions, same players. You answer, I'm going to ask. This time... Not the story of Exodus. This time, salvation of sinners. Who is being bought, being paid for? Okay, one point. <laughs> okay. What is the cost? Jesus is the cost. Okay. 
two points. <laughs> Who paid the cost? Three points. <laughs> Who received the payment? <laughs> this is a transaction. Who received payment of the cost so that the sinners will be redeemed? A lot of people are saying God. Some are not that sure. Why are we not sure? Because when we talk about ransom, we, we talk about we, we, we put it in our minds some kind of kidnapping happened. Right? When we talk about ransom, a ransom is usually paid to a kidnapper asking for a ransom so that they can give you the whoever got kidnapped, you, then you pay the ransom, right? In this case, what happened to us? Are, were we kidnapped? If we're the sinners and God's paying for our ransom, were we kidnapped? Were we kidnapped by Satan? <laughs> says, yeah, we are. <laughs> were we kidnapped by Satan? Because if that's the case, then Satan will get paid the ransom. That means he's the one who received the payment. Is that right? You want to know the right answer? Come back next week. Not next week, two weeks from now. Think about it, right? If Jesus is the cost, God pays, we're the ones he's paying for, who receives the payment? Want well, to know the answer? Come back next week. It's different from the story of the... Exodus, but we need to figure this out. We need to understand what happened to us and why God has to redeem us. Right? But once you figure it out, once you see it, you'll understand the next topic. The next topic of the I wills is called adoption. And the next topic of that is called possessions. So now how do we how do we kind of put all that stuff together? I think key is knowing who received the payment for the cost of our freedom. Okay? Come back. Hopefully I'll see you again in a couple of weeks and we'll talk about that when we return. Amen? Amen. At this point, I just want you to guys read the I wills of God <laughs> found in Exodus 6, 1-8 to and then think for yourself. Start to formulate. Yeah, which, when God says redeem, who is he redeeming us from? Right. Amen? <laughs> They're already thinking. That's good. That's good. <laughs> we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Let's close with a word of prayer. <laughs>